All right, guys, welcome. This is continuity. So we've got into limits already, and now we're going to get into continuity. And oh, get rid of my gum. So our job is to prove why a function is continuous or it is not continuous, meaning does it have continuity or is it discontinuous, right? And we can prove that using the rules of continuity, which are right here. So a function is continuous at the point x equals a if f of a is defined, meaning a point is defined. Two, if the limit as x approaches a exists. And three, if the limit value equals the y value of the defined point. So you must pass all three of these rules to be a continuous function. Well, it's too easy to be continuous. So today, we're going to be proving why functions are discontinuous by using the laws of continuity, the rules of continuity. Because look at the picture down below. That is a continuous function, right? You have a continuous function down below. So what we see here is that as you approach A from the left, you get F of A. As you approach A from the right, you also get F of A, which means that if the limit on the left is F of A and the limit on the right is F of A, the limit from both sides must also be f of a. So that passes rule number two for limits. So if you look above, two would pass, which means we just need two more to pass in order to be fully continuous. Well, to pass rule number one, does that point look like it's defined? It is. That is a closed circle. That means the point is defined. All right, well now, the third rule says, does the limit value equal the point value? Well, the limit as x approaches a, right? The limit as x approaches a of this function is f of a. And it just so happens that the point is defined at also f of a. So in reality, we have f of a equal to f of a, which is a true statement, which means that this would pass the third rule of continuity, meaning that this function or this graph is fully continuous. Well, that's no fun. We want to see what a discontinuous function looks like. And that's going to be the graph below. All right, so look at this. This one's prettier, way prettier than the one above it, right? Look at this. He's got some uh, character. That's what we'll say. All right, so use the definition of continuity to explain why the graph above is discontinuous. Well, that means let's look for the, we read graphs from left to right. So let's look for the first point of discontinuity. And that point is going to be right here. That point is right there. That's the first point of discontinuity. Why? Well, it's an open circle, right? Didn't it say the point had to be defined? So let me examine this a little bit more. Hang on. Let me zoom in. OK. So. And let's call this y value one. Why not? There it is, one and one. OK, so we want to examine near one. So this is how we prove the, that this is discontinuous by using the rules of continuity. OK, well, 
let's start with rule number one. Well, first, let me make this neat. I'll say x near one, right? x near one. So rule number one of continuity is a point defined. And if I say, what is f of 1, what do you give back to me? And is this an open circle or a closed circle? That is an open circle, which means the point is not defined. So f of 1 is undefined, meaning we just failed rule 1 of continuity. And if you fail one rule, it throws the rest out. So we don't even have to go on further, right? We don't have to go on further. But I want to go to step two just to show you about the, just to go over the limit. That's what I want to do. So this is a fail. Fail, right? OK. And then two. Let's look at the limit. We're going to say, what is the limit as x approaches 1 from both sides of this function? OK, so as we approach 1 from both sides, well, as I approach from the left, it looks like y is getting closer and closer to 1. As I approach one from the right, it looks like y is getting closer and closer to one. Well, this means that the limit from the left is one, the limit from the right is one. Therefore, the limit from both sides has to also be one. So this limit is one. But it does not matter because we already failed one rule of continuity. We already failed that rule. OK, so this would be a pass but it doesn't matter because we failed. Therefore, at x equals 1, we are discontinuous. OK, perfect. Now, let's look at the next point of discontinuity. Uh, I should have wrote that somewhere else. Oh, well. OK, so the next point of discontinuity looks like it's going to be at x equals 3, right? Looks like it's going to be at x equals 3. All right, so I'm just going to overwrite this, make it easy to erase. Let's call this value 2. And then here is three. OK, real messy, right? All right, so let's go over the rules again. Let's prove why it's discontinuous again, right? That's what I mean. So we'll say x near 3. OK. Well, oh, we need a value for this one too, right? We'll just call that one negative 1. OK. So x near 3, let's look at the first rule of continuity. Do we have a defined point? So if I say, what is f of 3? Well, on this x value of 3, you have an undefined point, which is here, and you have a defined point, which is down there. Well, since we have a defined point, a defined point, we will state the defined point, which means that we don't care about the undefined point. We can call it a, what's it called, a jump discontinuity. We only state the defined point, which means that at f of 3, y would be negative 1, which is a 
Yes. Hey, looking good, right? Looking good. Okay, which means we move on to rule two. The limit as x approaches three from both sides. Now here is where we run into an issue. As I approach three from the left, we see that y is getting closer and closer to negative one. So the limit from the left is negative one. And then as I approach three from the right, y is getting closer and closer to two. So this means that the limit from the left is negative one, the limit from the right is two. Are those limits equal? And that answer is no. Since the limit from the left is negative one and the limit from the right is two, the limit from both sides does not exist, which means we have a fail and it throws everything out. Ugh. But hey, that's what we're here for. We want to prove why this is discontinuous by using the rules of continuity. That's what they're meant for. They're meant to show, to prove why things are discontinuous. Because like I said, it's too easy to be continuous. If you want to be continuous, you're going to be the graph above. No fun. Pretty boring, okay? All right. All right, now let's look for the last point where discontinuity is. And that's gonna be right here at x equals five. Let's call this point three, right? And this one, I know it's not straight, but it's gonna be one. Okay, excellent. So uh, let's go ahead and do it again. So we're gonna say, x near five, x near five, all right? Rule number one says, what is f of five? And again, we only state the defined point, which is right there. We only state the defined point. So f of five is gonna be three, which is a pass. Looking good, right? Looking good. All right. Rule two says, what is the limit as x approaches five from both sides of f of x? All right. So, as we approach five from the left, I have to come down, whoops. I have to come down this way. I run out of graph, so I have to hop up here, start again up here, come down, and as I get closer and closer to five from the left, we see that y gets closer and closer to one. All right, so the limit from the left is one. Now, I approach five from the right, and we see that my y values are getting closer and closer again to one. Therefore, the limit from the left is one, the limit from the right is one, therefore the limit from the limit from both sides must also be one. Look at that. That is another pass. All right.
Okay. Well, we're looking good. We've passed rule one of continuity. We've passed rule two of continuity. Now we go on to rule three of continuity. The limit as x approaches five of f of x must be equal to f of five. All right. Well, what is the limit as x approaches five? That limit happens to be one. So the limit is one. What is the defined point value at f of five? That value is three. Now we run into an issue because does the limit value equal the defined value, the defined y value of the point? And that answer is no. One definitely does not equal three which means we have a fail, which means at x equals five, we are also discontinuous. Okay, did I write that up here? No. Okay, so once again, it was just an exercise using the rules of continuity to show why a function is discontinuous at a certain point, at a certain x value. All right, that's going to be on the next examples as well. So on these examples, we just want to know why is it discontinuous, right? And there are different types of discontinuities. This is called a removable, removable discontinuity. And the reason this is called a removable discontinuity is because you can actually factor and simplify this function. You can make this function f of x equals x minus 2 over x plus 1 over x minus 2 your x minus twos would cancel and leave us with a new function of f of x equal to x plus one. But no matter what, the domain of the original function was x can equal two, which means no matter if you remove the discontinuity, if you remove the denominator, the new function, no matter what, still has to follow the original domain. So it still has to abide by that, which means that at x equals 2, we will get a whole. Because remember, with rational functions, let's say if you couldn't get rid of the denominator, this would be a vertical asymptote. But since you're able to reduce it, you get rid of the vertical asymptote and it becomes a hole in the graph because it still has to abide by the original domain. Now, using the rules of continuity really fast, why is this discontinuous, right? Why is this discontinuous? Well, let's look at it a little closer. Let me make this graph up a little better. We'll say that's three. Well, if you look at it, for the first rule of continuity, if I said, what is f of two? Guess what type of circle we have? We have an undefined 
circle, which gives us a fail. There's no need to go even, even go over the next two rules. If it's undefined, it's done. Let's move on. This means that at x equals two, we are discontinuous. Not even gonna write all that out. I'm gonna keep moving. Don't wanna waste too much time on this uh, simple calculus, right? Okay. All right. In infinite discontinuity, okay. So why is this function discontinuous, right? Why is this one discontinuous? Well, we have a piecewise function, one over x squared if x can't equal zero, that's given because the denominator can't equal zero. So these graphs are headed up towards infinity. But if you look, we also have a defined point. This says when x equals zero, y will be one, which is this point here. So this means that we are gonna have to bust out the rules of continuity, which means rule number one says, what is f of zero? And since there is a defined point there, f of zero is one, which is a definite pass. I feel that green should be passed, not red. Oh well, too late, right? All right, two says, what is the limit as x approaches zero of f of x? Okay, well, as I approach zero from the left, my y values on the left side are headed towards where? Infinity. Then, as I approach zero from the right, my y values on the right side are also headed towards infinity. Well, we haven't learned about infinite limits, and we know that infinity cannot meet ever because we have no idea what infinity is. So if the limit from the left is infinity and the limit from the right is infinity, we have to say that this limit, since we have no idea what infinity is, does not exist. But then that changes in the next section because once we learn about infinite limits and limits at infinity, we can actually properly put infinity down. But we haven't learned it, and therefore, since a limit does not exist, that is a fail, which means x equals zero, is discontinuous. I can leave that drawing up, right? Yeah, it's beautiful. All right, keep going. All right, three is exactly the same as the first one we did on the last page. Uh, it's a removable discontinuity. Uh, what was this one? Yeah. That's a removable discontinuity. So what happens is that we knew the function can exist, cannot exist at x equals two, but then they decide to make a piece function and say, well, we're gonna make this function exist at two by putting a defined point there. Can they do that? Yes, you can. Okay, so busting out the rules of continuity. We have one, oops. what is f of two? And f of two, we can actually state this defined point now. f of two is going to be one, which means that is a pass. And then here comes two. What is the limit 
as x approaches 2 from both sides. Now here's where we mess up, right? The limit as we approach 2 from both sides. OK, well, I think from earlier, this point, I think, was 3. It's fine. It can be any number because you'll see why this limit, uh, well, you'll see. So as I approach 2 from the left, y gets closer and closer to 3. So the limit from the left is 3. As I approach 2 from the right, my y value gets closer and closer again to 3. So this means that the limit from both sides has to be 3, which is a pass. Ooh, 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 which is good, right? Okay. But then we come to the dreadful step three, which says the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x must be equal to f of 2. Well, what is the limit value? The limit value is 3. What is the point value? The point y value is 1. Are those equal? Definitely not. Therefore, we fail again. And x equals 2 is still discontinuous. Okay. There you go. Again, just an exercise of using the rules of continuity. All right. So next, if you've ever seen this function, it's called the greatest integer function. It outputs the greatest integer. If you don't know what an integer is, an integer is just a whole number, a whole number from negative infinity to positive infinity. So if I said, what is the greatest integer of 4.5, it would output 4. It doesn't round. It just wants the greatest integer. It could even be 4.9, and you would still get an output of Four. So that's all it does. Okay. Well, why is the greatest integer function discontinuous? I think you see it already. Look at all those open circles. That just spells discontinuity everywhere, right? That's just discontinuous, discontinuous, discontinuous. But let's pick an x value. Let's say 2, right? Let's examine near 2. So if I said, oh, what's better? Yeah, we'll just keep it two. All right. So if we brought out our dis rules of continuity, if I say, what is f of 2? And here's 2. Oh, that's perfect. Let me see. Here's 2, and I have a value here and a value here. Well. Do you state the undefined point or do you state the defined point? Of course, we state the defined point. So f of 2 is going to be 2. That is a pass. 2. The limit as x approaches 2 of f of x. Now here's where things get fun. Okay, so as I approach 2 from the left, you see that my y values have to keep jumping, right? They have to keep jumping. I'm here, I'm here, and then I'm slowly getting here. 
So this means that the limit from the left is one. And then if I approach two from the right, we are again jumping down now, right? So I have to come here and then I have to jump down here. And as I approach two from the right, you see that y slowly starts to approach two. Therefore, the limit from the left is one, the limit from the right is two, therefore does one equal two, and that is no. Which means that that limit does not exist, and that means we fail. Okay which means, well, basically, at all these x values, we are discontinuous. So we can say all x values discontinuous. All right. And that's how you use the rules of continuity. All right. Well, let's move on. All right. Well, there's something you do know, and that happens to be the domain of a function. You know how to find the domain of a function. And guess what? Continuity and domain go hand in hand. A function is continuous only where its domain lets it be continuous. So I'll write down examples of these functions. A, a constant function, f of x equals k, where k is a constant. Remember, a constant is just a number without a variable. A constant function is continuous for all x. A constant function is basically just y equals some number. I'll say y equals 5. y equals 5. What type of line does that make? A horizontal line. I hope you didn't say straight line. All lines are straight. So y equals five is a horizontal line. There are no breaks in the graph. Therefore, it is a fully continuous function. All right. Next, for n a positive integer, f of x equals x to the n is continuous for all x. So if you have a positive whole number exponent, or degree, then you have a fully continuous function. And that would look like y equals x, y equals x squared, y equals x cubed, y equals x to the 100. No matter what, you are continuous for all x. Your domain is all real numbers. OK. A polynomial function is continuous for all x. So a polynomial is just like this. x squared plus 1, y equals x plus 2, et cetera, et cetera. Like y equals x cubed plus x plus 2. These are polynomials. What does it mean to be a polynomial? What are the characteristics of a polynomial? It's simple. To be a polynomial, all your exponents have to be whole positive numbers. All your exponents have to be positive integers. That's what it means. We know what a polynomial function is. So right now, the domain for a, b, and c is all real numbers, meaning they are continuous everywhere. OK. <clears throat> D. A rational function is continuous for all x except those values that make your denominator zero. All right, we've seen rational functions. So if I were to write, oops, not that, y equals x over x plus one, this function would be continuous everywhere except that x not equal to negative one. So your domain would be x not equal to negative one. It would exist everywhere except at negative one. It would be continuous everywhere 
except that negative one. All right. E for n, an odd positive integer greater than one, the nth root of f of x is continuous wherever f of x is continuous. This means for any odd root, you are continuous wherever your inside function is continuous. So if I just wrote y equal the cube root of x plus two, this is a fully continuous function because what do we know about odd roots? You can take the odd root of a negative number, you can take the odd root of zero, and you can take the odd root of a positive number. So odd roots, depending on the function inside, are continuous everywhere. And when I say depending on the function inside, let's say that we were given y equals the fifth root of one over x. This function will be continuous everywhere except at what number? Zero, because can you plug zero into that denominator? No. Okay. <clears throat> f, an even positive integer, the nth root of f of x is continuous wherever f of x is continuous and non-negative. That means, simple enough, the square root of x. That's an even root. So if you have the square root of x, your domain is x has to be greater than or equal to zero. So the domain tells you where you can be continuous at, where you have continuity. All right. And then trig functions. You know, well, probably not anymore, but you've seen the domains of trig functions, and those domains are where they are continuous. Sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant. You remember all those domains, right? Sure. All right. Uh, we have a little composition, a composition theorem dealing with limits. You know, compositions where we compose two functions together. So this says if f is continuous at b and the limit of g of x as x approaches a is b, then the limit as x approaches a of f of g of x is f of b. This means that if you have the limit of a composition function, you can apply the limit inside the composition, right? You can apply the limit inside the composition. All right, that's all that says. All right, and then B, if G is continuous at A and F is continuous at G of A, then the composite function F of G is given by F composed G of X equal to F of G of X. So basically, once again, if you compose functions, the outside function has to take the domain of the inside function. So it's, the composition is only continuous where the inside function is continuous. That's all this says. This is nothing new. The only thing new is probably some words and that limit theorem right above. That's it. All right. These examples. Where, on what intervals is each function continuous? If you see that, all it's asking for is find the domain. Find the domain. Know what type of function you're working with. Number one, or number five, f of x equals x to the 100th minus 2x to the 37 plus 75. This is a polynomial because you have whole positive exponents. So this is a polynomial. And your domain is all reals. All right. Next, this is a rational. This is a rational function, right? Because rational is just fancy for fraction. And to find the domain of a rational function, we know you set the denominator equal to zero. So you would have if you set the denominator equal to zero, you would get that your domain is x 
cannot equal plus or minus one. Or even better, an interval notation, negative infinity to negative one, union, negative one to one, union, one to infinity. All right. Ooh, h of x, this is all over the place. We have a radical with rational, right? So this is radical with rational. Which means this is a two-part domain. <clears throat> you have to find the domain of the square root first. And the domain of this square root of x, that domain, we'll call it domain 1, is x has to be greater than or equal to 0. And then from this rational, we'll call that domain 2. This one says that x cannot equal one. And then from this part, which is domain three, well, x squared plus one, nothing can any, no numbers can make it zero other than imaginary numbers. So this domain is negative infinity to infinity. So how do we piece these three together? What's going to work? All right, so we can exist everywhere. We can, well, first, we have to be greater than 0, and we cannot exist at 1. So this means that our total domain should be bracket 0, go up the number line, stop at 1. and then. Union one to infinity. All right. And then number eight, this is a composite function. What two functions do you see together? You see sine and x squared, right? So we can call this a trig composite. Well, think of the domain of the sine function. Domain one. What's the domain of sine? Sine goes on infinitely, right? So that domain is negative infinity to infinity. Then, what's the domain of x squared? x squared is a parabola, and parabolas go on infinitely. So if domain one and domain two are all real numbers, then the domain of this whole thing is all real numbers. So, this, the domain, tells you where your function is continuous at. It tells you the continuity of the given function. Okay, awesome. Last page. These are fun. Okay. For what value of the constant c is the function f continuous on negative infinity to infinity. All right, so we want this function to be continuous, right? We want this function to be continuous. So if you think about the rules of continuity, we need a point to be defined. Well, if you look at our piecewise function, on the first restriction, it just says less than two. 
So two is not defined. But then on the second piece, you have greater than or equal to two, which means two is defined, which means we pass rule one of continuity. We have a defined point. But then we need to do part two, which means we need to have a limit exist. We need a limit to exist. So in order for a limit to exist, we need to show a left-hand limit and a right-hand limit at two. And in order for it to exist, we need the left hand to be equal to the right hand. So that's what we're gonna do on this exercise. We know a point is defined, that's perfect. Now we have to make sure a limit exists. So this is how we're gonna start. And again, this is another exercise in connecting limits with piecewise restrictions. So it's actually pretty neat. So I'm going to increase, we'll call this number one. So we're gonna say, the limit as x approaches two from the left. The limit as x approaches two from the left of f of x. Well, if we have a limit from the left, that means all my x values must be less than two, right? because you're coming from the left side of the axis, x-axis where all the values are less than two. So this limit connects to this restriction, which allows us to use this equation. So we get the limit as x approaches two from the left of cx squared plus 2x. And now all we have to do is plug in 2. And this is going to give us the limit from the left. Which means I'll get c times 2 squared plus 2 times 2 and that'll give me 4c plus 4. So this is the limit from the left, right? This is the left hand. All right, save that, and now we have two. We want the limit as x approaches two from the right of f of x. Okay, and if you are doing the limit from the right at two, this means all your numbers must be bigger than two, because you're coming from the right side of the x-axis. So this means that we connect with this restriction, which means we are allowed to use this function. Which I rewrite as the limit as x approaches two from the right, of x cubed minus cx. And now plug in two. Two cubed minus c times two. Sorry for the ugly looking c's. I'm just trying to not make them look like parentheses. <laughs> 
and you'll get eight minus two C. And this is the right hand. Okay. Well now, we want a limit to exist, which means three, we want, we want a limit to exist. So for a limit to exist, the left hand must equal the right hand. So we want the limit as x approaches two from the left of f of x to be equal to the limit as x approaches two from the right of f of x. Well, we know the limit from the left and we know the limit from the right, so set them equal to each other. So we're gonna set these guys equal to each other. So four, four C plus four equal to eight minus two C. And now solve for C. 6c equals what? 4 divided by 6. C is 4, 6 or 2 thirds. Okay, so in order for this function, for this piecewise function to be fully continuous, from negative infinity to infinity, the value of C must be two thirds. Because we have a point defined at two, and now our limits are equal if and only if C is two thirds. And if you wanted to do the last rule, the point value would equal the limit value at two. Okay, so that's how you work those. Here's number 10. I will leave this up to you to attempt and come to class with questions about it. I can definitely go over it, but you'll try it out the exact same way. There's just an extra step in here. That's it. So that is continuity. Not bad, right? Okay, that's it.